welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry, and social justice. Hello, and welcome to the Madden America podcast. I'm Micah Engel, a doctoral student in psychology at the University of West Georgia, and a research news writer for the Madden America website. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Mary Watkins to talk about her background and her work at the forward edge of psychology. Dr. Watkins is chair of the Depth Psychology Program and co-chair and professor in the Community Liberation, Indigenous, and Eco-Psychologies Program at Pacifica Graduate Institute in California. Dr. Watkins has a foundation in the depth psychologies of Carl Jung and James Hellman, as well as holistic approaches to community healing such as liberation and eco-psychology. Her research interests also include a focus on the restorative power of dialogue, creative imagination, forced migration, adoption, socioeconomic justice, and Quaker studies. In addition to numerous articles, she has published several books such as Waking Dreams, Invisible Guests, The Development of Imaginal Dialogues, Toward Psychologies of Liberation with Dr. Helene Shulman, Up Against the Wall, Reimagining the U.S.-Mexico Border with Dr. Edward Casey, and most recently, Mutual Accompaniment and the Creation of the Commons. Thank you for taking the time to speak with me today, Dr. Watkins. Thank you, Micah. Thank you for the invitation. All right, so let's jump right in here. So can you give a basic description of your interests as a psychologist? You know, I I began reading psychology in my adolescence. I was mainly reading Freud and Bettelheim. And when I got to college, uh, I was stunned that the psychology that I was learning, that would have been in 1968, mm. was uh, completely different from what I thought psychology was going to be. Yeah. And, you know, I've been involved now with psychology for almost 50 years. And I think um, I've had an abiding desire to reorient theory in psychology and to reorient practice. And I had a a very important mentor when I was in graduate school at Clark University named Bernie Kaplan. And Bernie was a developmental psychologist. I was studying both developmental and clinical psychology. And we were studying a lot of Piaget at that point. Bernie was quite clear that Piaget had an interest in logical thought. And so when he watched and observed his own children, he was picking out what they did that was relevant to that interest because he was committed to seeing logical thinking develop. And what Bernie did for me with regard to developmental psychology was to say, um, instead of studying what is, which actually is quite impossible because you're always bringing your values to it. And um, why not uh, make very clear what your values are and then um, study what, what, how you would like to see things transform? What, what are the end goals that you're most interested in and what are the conditions for people and communities um, that would help bring about those ends and what mitigates against it. And that's been very, very helpful to me as I've tried to orient my work around social justice, um, sustainable peace and environmental concerns um, to be able to say, uh, what are, what, what are the kinds of psychology? What are our approaches to psychology that would be helpful in reaching those ends in solidarity with other people. So I would say my interests are in really looking at theory and practice with regard to liberatory ends. Thank you. So you mentioned your relationship with uh, the professor, was it Dr. Kaplan? Yes. So can you talk a little bit more about your background and kind of how you got into this work? Initially, when I was in in college, I I, I fell into a, a deep depression, and in that depression, the the imaginal world was very vivid for me. I was able to, you know, kind of close my eyes and see images quite clearly um, on both sides of sleep. So 
I had to write a, a senior thesis. So I, I began to do a lot of research into the use of fantasy and imagination for, for healing across cultures, but also within Eurocentric psychologies. And that's, mm. that's what brought me to the study of, of Jung. And then, um, a couple of years later, two years later, to uh, the study of James Hillman's work in archetypal psychology. So at first I was turning towards psychology as a way to really understand myself and to understand my family, the dynamics of my family, my mother's psychology, et cetera, as well as thinking that I would I would enjoy helping other people in that in a in a kind of clinical clinical way. Right. So I, I I began to um, right after college, I began to work in an, uh, a Cambridge City Hospital in Cambridge in an uh, inpatient unit and was living at the same time in an experimental community of people who had been uh, in uh, psychiatric hospitalization um, as young people f- for schizophrenia and who were now living in a halfway house situation. This was about the same time that R.D. Lang was doing his work, and so there was a lot of interest in how people could uh, accompany each other in in situations of of psychosis. So I was it was sort of um, seeing both the way that this unfolds within a psychiatric wing of a community hospital, and also um, just living living with people. So that you know that eventually took me to to the Jung Institute in Zurich um, because I was trying to rewrite my senior thesis, which was on waking dreams into a book. And I was lucky enough to find the work of James Hillman. And really at that point, uh, he had already written dreams in the underworld. um, And he was just delivering the lectures that, formed revisioning psychology and it was very very exciting moment um, in Jungian studies because he was really breaking with a a few of the taken for granted ideas within Jungian work and trying to um, show what what it would be like to to practice and to think with imagination more in the forefront of concern you know, when I when I pr- came out of my eight and a half years of graduate study, um, I was the expectation was really that I would go straight into teaching. That was the expectation of Clark, but I I, I really really wasn't able to do that because I hadn't yet discerned what was worthwhile to teach. And part of the problem was that I had really three separate sets of interests one in spirituality, one in political issues, and one in psychology, and they were completely divorced from one another. Um, And I had to figure out slowly how they fit together. And for instance, um, in the early 80s in in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, Helen Caldicott, um, the pediatrician from Australia that founded Physicians for Social Responsibility Mm. was really waking up people about the nuclear uh, danger. And I I actually had a whole series of of nightmares during that time about um, nuclear Armageddon. And in the usual way, at that at that point in time, even within the Jungian world, the way of interpreting those kinds of dreams would be um, in terms of repressed issues of rage, etc. Right. Um, it, it was re- quite clear to me that that it it wasn't about that. It it was about genuine concern um, that was breaking in fr- from the outside in, and it it was helping me clarify that the the veil really be, that we imagine between the inside and the outside is just enormously porous so that when we begin to focus on our what, what we think of as our own subjectivity we really find the the world inside of us as and and not just ourselves but other people animals places you know earth um and 
And so I began to see that there were some key ideas in psychology that that had to be um, really critically reflected on and and alternatives posed. And one of the most central ones was individualism, which I think now is rather widely understood to be uh, a, a Euro-American construct that's particularly severe in the United States in terms of radical individualism, where we we imagine um, our development of firm, equal boundaries that separate us from others and our development of uh, logic, mastery, and control right. that um, successes that we enjoy are the fruits of our own labors rather than coming out of our own complex uh, positionality socioculturally and historically. So when I began to 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 see that a lot of the depth psychological theory that I had been learning and that I was using in my own clinical practice really was embedded within this paradigm of individualism. And so that it meant the clinical work was was trying to attune itself to helping individuals um, survive and thrive in the midst of a wide variety of sociocultural historical crises. But those crises very rarely ever were articulated as any kind of contextual backdrop or any kind of causative framework for the kinds of misery um, and, and suffering that people were experiencing. So I began to try to turn to what, what would happen if we, if we thought about people in a much more interdependent fashion um, and, and really saw them, uh, their own well-being as coinciding with the well-being of their families, their communities, their schools, their ecosystems. And, and then, um, if so, then we have to, in a way, liberate our, our psychological thinking and our psychological practice from the narrow confines of clinical practice as it, as it was being framed. So that actually gets to a question that I wanted to ask you about. Um, so in one of your articles, uh, From Individualism to the Interpe- Interdependent Self, um, you, you had a line that I really liked. You said that playgrounds are as important as consulting rooms. Um, but in, in this article, you, you still left room for individual therapy as a place where, you know, awareness can enter, enter and grow. Those were your words. Um, so has that, has your perspective on therapy changed at all? Or is that the same? That it still kind of holds an important place alongside these more contextual approaches? That was a very early paper. I think I wrote that in 1989. Mm. Um, and it, it, it was actually trying to articulate just exactly what we were speaking about earlier. Um, I, I value individual psychotherapy. I think there are many points in our life that we reach where speaking through things in the presence of somebody who is compassionate, whom we can trust, um, who who really gives their attention to us. Um, And sometimes their love can be extremely um, transformative. Um, Of course, it's, it's, it's a sort of a cultural um, creation um, that, that works with certain groups you know, it has its genesis in, in Europe and right. a foothold in the U.S. Many cultures wouldn't approach the kind of difficulties they have in that way. And so I, I was also, you know, in a wake-up call about a, a, pre, a predisposition in mainstream psychology to universalize um, findings and approaches that come from one historical cultural context into multiple ones. And uh, that's one of the reasons why we have indigenous psychologies and in the specialization that I co-chair is, is to try to, to work with psychology in a much more humble way, because of course there, there are many ways that people become more conscious and more knowledgeable about their situation, right? right? 
So maybe shifting a little bit to the the type of work that you've been doing for a while now, away from the more individualizing um, types of work, even though they have their place. Um, can you talk about any liberation type work that you've done? Sure. Let me let me um, reflect for a moment on. I, I was I was describing this split in my own life, and uh, in in the eighties, I was on the weekends working with social activists. Um, some concerned with the nuclear situation, some working on other issues, and we would we would work quite deeply, and they would have a very um, profound feelings that would come up about the issues that they were working on, the state of their communities. And when I would go back into my private practice on Monday, um, I I realized that that many of the the kinds of emotion and also the, the kinds of topics that people were caring about deeply didn't didn't arise in in the individual sessions. And I think that that was because that that both um, clinicians and people seeking um, clinical you know work ha- had been prompted really to think about their situation in the most private possible way so that the exterior context, it didn't seem like it was either necessary or important to to bring that into the sessions. Um, and so that began to help me orient a little bit differently w- within my sessions. And I, I, I joined a group of clinicians um, who were who would share cases with each other and try to look at how the the individual problems that people were bringing could be linked with the larger socio-cultural context mm-hmm. and how there might be a, uh, you know ways to to change uh, our habitual um, frame of, of the sessions, um, but then. This was about the same time in 1985. Um, I was setting about adopting um, my first daughter, and uh, she was coming from Northeast Brazil. And so I began to learn everything possible I could about Northeast Brazil, its food, its music, its thought, its history. And I came across the work of Paulo Freire. And Paulo Freire, um, you really um, changed my life, his work as a, a pedagogist, as a critical thinker. Uh, for me, w- the way that he was working with people and with groups was, the, in a way, the missing half of deaf psychology. Mm. And so I began to to try to orient some of my clinical work more toward groups so that um, people felt less like the difficulty that they were harboring was a result of their own, often their own failure, their own difficulty. They could begin to see that others were were also trying to navigate a particular terrain and that together they could get some traction to, to understand why this was a situation that was appearing like subjectively, mm. but roots in the larger sociocultural terrain. Um, so for instance, working I was working for a while with groups of, of moms who who desperately love their children, but who also found themselves um, injuring their children. Mm-hmm. And we we did a a, a sort of uh, anthropological dive into uh, how mothering happens across cultures and across history and began to realize that in most cultures in the world and across history, you would never think to place the care of young children um, in one person's hand over long, long periods of time. That um, mothering in most cultures has a lot of other women around you. You're the, your older children, your older daughters, your sisters, your 
to your aunts, your cousins, your mother. Um, when that happens, you can, when you're having a difficult day, you can, you can have another person um, step in a little bit for you. And about that time, I was, I was teaching um, object relations at a, in a very early class. So I was teaching at Pacifica and uh, an Iranian woman raised her hand and she said, you know, I'm following what you're saying with Fairbairn and Guntrip's theories, et cetera. But I have to say that um, I never had to internalize my mother's negative states in the way that you're describing because I had many other possible caretakers around me. Um, so I didn't have the particular um, set of difficulties say that Winnicott is describing, um, it, 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 it's quite different. And that was, that was, um, you know, very illuminating for me. Right. <laughs> yeah. So with, with Frere, um, and I don't know how much your, your listeners know about Frere. Um, you know, he was living in Northeast Brazil and, uh, where there was, this would have been in the seventies, um, and, and there was a very high level of illiteracy, and he, he was quite interested in helping people gain literacy, but he was even more interested in helping people gain a sociocultural literacy in understanding how the kinds of issues that they, that they really suffered at, at the individual level, the subjective level, um, had its roots in the sociocultural mm-hmm. terrain and were shared by others and that if people could put their thoughts together um, they could begin to create pathways that could transform the the living situations that that they were in and you know now you you can go to many many places all over the world and people can call it many different things but people are essentially using a, a frarian methodology of of trying to articulate what the problems are, to put knowledge together from various perspectives, to ascertain a pathway, um, to imagine how it could be otherwise, and to begin to do actions together to to gain a sense of agency and also a foothold to transform the, the situation. Mm. So, um, so that... That, uh, you know, led me to the work of, of Franz Fanon, of Albert Mimi, of liberation psychologist Martin Barreau from El Salvador, um, to really see that, you know, for instance, um, if you study Franz Fanon, you realize that he was a phenomenologist um, of, of monumental proportions. So why was his name never brought up when I studied at Duquesne? And why, when I began to to teach Fanon at at, at um, Pacifica, did some of my colleagues tell me, you know, question me, why would I teach Fanon? He had nothing to do with psychology. And so you see that, you know, that there's a kind of like a white world of, of psychology right. um, that can be very um, rooted in Eurocentric biases that actually is mispositioned to to help in many different situations that people find themselves in. So if you, you know, psychology can have many, many different goals. You have to articulate what are your goals. So if, if your goals are liberatory goals, then you have to begin to take, take from many different places, not only within psychology, but within other disciplines, sociology, pedagogy, history, um, political science, anthropology, right. etc. So that your your allegiance isn't to psychology as a discipline. It's to liberatory, psychosocial, and I think at this point we have to add e- ecological, environmental work because guess what? You know, our we can't we can't pursue our own well being outside of the effects of our own living on the ecosystems that we're part of. So the work I've been doing more recently, um, I guess since 2002, has to do with um, borders and forced migration. Um, 
I, I had a powerful experience at the first time I encountered the U.S. wall at the next U.S.-Mexico border in 2002 um, and saw the way in which in the San Diego sector in a place called Friendship Park, you have people divided by this wall, which has now become increasingly militarized. Um, family members that that can't can no longer live side by side, and that that tragedy that I experienced that day for the first time because I had grown up on the East Coast and was very new to California at that moment mm. um, has now you know become a, a tragedy of, of monumental proportions and a tragedy in in many countries as as people are are forced to migrate and and find themselves locked out right. um, you know now um, I have actually gone back to a part of my clinical work that I I, I didn't use much at all uh, which which was psychological and forensic evaluation I'm, I'm working now with people in detention centers who are seeking asylum and who need uh, a forensic evaluation to to help the immigration court understand um, that they are credible, mm. that the kind of traumas that they have experienced and that they're talking about are consistent with their psychological state. That's one branch of what I'm doing presently, and the other is is working in prison settings with educational initiatives. Um, you know, there's a wonderful series that just began, I guess, last week um, on PBS about college inside um, prison, um, articulating the BARD prison initiative that allows prisoners to get a, a BA inside prison. And, you know, I would say that there was a certain point as I began to teach that I realized that education itself is therapeutic. You know, education of, of a certain kind, you know, not a banking education as, as Freire would um, criticize a lot of education where you're just supposed to learn and regurgitate things, but a critical education that helps you to, to think about your, your place in the world and, and in, and in history. And I, I, I deeply believe that now that um, that kind of education is, is one of the best forms of of coming to coming to know yourself if that's what we think of as one of the goals of of therapy of, of caring for the soul a more ecological self yes yes a more ecological self you know that I mean that that term comes from Arnie Nace that we have inside of us you know, Every, every place we've also ever been, not just the people that we love and that we've come into contact with, but, but also the, the plants and the animals and the mountains and the rivers that we've swum in, et cetera. So it sounds kind of like your introduction into liberatory work was maybe pretty unique, that you kind of had to go out into the community and find places and people that... Uh, wanted to work with you. Do you do you see any? Maybe it's gotten better. Do you see any pathways kind of into this work for psychologists or just people who are interested? Absolutely. I was recently at a CISR conference, Psychologists for Social Responsibility conference, at the Wright Institute in Berkeley called Healing Justice on Decarceration, mm. and. There were many, many people who had been inside who took part in the conference and were teaching psychologists. And of all the all the people who had been inside a prison system, none of them had had a positive interaction with any mental health provider except one who had given them uh, the right form to fill out for a parole request. Wow. And yet it was quite clear that they all – or at least the ones I, I, I spoke with, um, would have welcomed someone to have ongoing uh, conversations with that were attentive to the kinds of trauma that they were experiencing and the 
kind of desperate situation they were in. Mm-hmm. So I mean, one problem when you when you go as a mental health provider into a prison, every every conversation you have with the prisoner is 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 not private. Right. It's part of 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 the record, if you will. Um, they spoke about people psychologists coming to the SHU, to the special housing units where they're in um, solitary confinement and speaking through, shouting through the door at them um, so that the conversation would be her, oh, would inevitably be overheard by many other people. So that's not a, uh, that's not a, con- a, a conversational context in which they would engage. Right. So what if, what if the psychologically minded people person joined a prison visitation program and visited a person over time and developed a relationship that that might have many of the aspects that you would think of that are therapeutic but outside of the usual frame of of therapy first of all there's no payment um second of all it's not linked into an institutional framework um it's not based on expert knowledge because the person who would be doing the accompanying uh, would also be learning quite a lot from the person who's inside. So that's just one, one example that, that, that there is the need in many, many places for people who can be available, who, who can witness, who can listen, um, who can s- sustain contact uh, over time so that they can be trusted um, and s- so that they can, you know, not just be kind of parachuting into a situation. Um, many of us are called into particular crises that are going on. Like I, I articulated in my 30s, I got this unusual call into the, uh, nuclear right. crisis and, and followed that for about 10 years. And then when I hit the U.S. Mexico wall, you know, I had this like unusual, like feeling of re- revulsion about it. We, we, some people, it will be a river that they loved when they were young and now it's polluted or it will be, um, reaching out to older people, um, so I think if we start with where we're called, and that can come in a dream, it can come in what we're tracking in the newspaper or where we our heart gets moved, we can begin to invest ourselves there. And then in time, as we get to know that situation, where our psychological knowledge can be of use, uh, can be discerned, and if there's other kind of knowledges that we need, we can go about learning them or finding who are resources that could be, um, you know, asked, asked to enter the situation. So I, I'll, sh- I'll tell you about a situation in the, my present hometown of Santa Barbara, California, where I teach. Um, so I mentioned coming from the East Coast. I, I, I didn't understand this town where I arrived. Mm. Um, I'd never spend any time on the West Coast, but if you get up early and you you drive downtown, it, it's a little bit like a little Beijing because there are people in bicycles mm. riding all around, something you don't see later on in the day. Right. Um, just, you the housing all looks nice, um, but you know, like one day I was helping a daughter find a place to live and I opened the garage door of a place she was thinking of renting and I saw there 15 mattresses and people who, a, a young boy, 13, um, there were no bathrooms, no kitchen. This was a place where 15 people who had come across the border were living. So, so I began to um, search out a group that was invested in justice for for immigrants and human rights and just began to attend their meetings um and it was called pueblo it it eventually morphed into a group called cause and i would do whatever needed to be done help with child care bring a little food whatever and then in the second year um a young person stood up and she said 
that she had a dream that she she would like to create an oral history of what it's like to live in Santa Barbara without your documents, without your citizenship papers. And, uh, but she didn't know exactly how to go about that if anybody was interested in helping. And I, I knew something about oral history and so I volunteered and a number of, of young people were very interested in this process. Um, my Spanish was so poor at that moment that I didn't really understand until a few months later that everybody in the room, 20 people, that that none of them had documents. Mm. So they were actually interested in um, bringing forth the stories of their families and their neighbors. Um, and and they, they did so in a really beautiful way through interviews and translation and then um, creating testimonials that could be brought to churches and schools and um, community groups where they could begin to to what they wanted to do was to really incite compassion mm. in citizen neighbors for their own situation. So that's a kind of example of, you know, when we take something that we, we're moved to understand more about it and we, we just commit ourselves to showing up, we can begin to understand how how we might be of some use. Um, and of course, we need an invitation. You wouldn't show up at a group that didn't want you there, you know. And there are many reasons why people don't want strangers showing up in groups because of being infiltrated and being undermined um, by people who really shouldn't be there, who don't have good intentions. Um, but I think that psychologists can open the consulting door, both so that uh, they can connect the issues that people are bringing with with history, with sociocultural and ecological issues, but also to walk out past the consulting door as as citizens who are available to in a in a psychologically minded way. Mm. That there's a great need for that in many many different contexts, and that's one thing that we've learned. You know, at Pacifica, over the last 20 years, um, our students who are s- studying in this way have have really worked in, I'd say, about six or seven hundred different community kinds of contexts, not as clinicians. Um, and it could be in a humane society where a lot of the animals are being put killed, euthanized, and the staff is like traumatized. Mm. It could be helping Palestinians rebuild a home that's been destroyed by Israeli demolition. It, it could be working on a community garden inside of a prison or, or helping youth put their experiences into hip hop inside of a juvenile detention facility. Mm. I mean, it, the, the needs are really many, many places. And so in, in the same way that we talk about independent scholarship, I think we have to talk about um, people creating the niches in which their um, psychosocial and ecological work can unfold. And that can be within the context of nonprofits, foundations, within schools, community groups. Um, to begin to write themselves in um, uh, because people also need to be compensated for their work, right? Right. Um, People who are compensated for their work can can use that compensation to fund pro bono work that needs to happen. And I I remind people that when Freud uh, in, in Vienna in 1919, he he made a requirement of all analysts who wanted to join the International Association of Psychoanalysts that they had to tithe a, either a day, a week of work um, to people who could not afford uh, psychoanalysis but who could profit from it or give the income from a day of work to uh, those who could do that work. Mm. And... Um, you know, I, I, sometimes I would think about it in terms of private practice and public practice mm. and the the ethic of um, 
you know, trying in our lives to balance those in a way that reflects the moment that we're in, you know, where a lot of people who could who could use that kind of listening, witnessing, what I'm calling accompaniment, um, can't afford it um, and wouldn't know where to find it, if you know, given their own life experiences. So you've talked about accompaniment, and I think I'm, I've gotten a, a decent picture of what you mean by that. Um, when it comes to the, the second part of the title of your most recent book, Creation of the Commons, um, what's your what's your vision for that? And do you think that accompaniment in the, the ways that you're talking about leads to this creation of the commons? Yes, I think it's at the heart of creating commons. Um, there's a story I, I give in the in the last chapter uh, when uh, in Ireland people were being driven off their land um, when when the commons were being enclosed and uh, there may be uh, neighbors down the road who would have taken in those people who were losing their their land. And they were told that if they took in these people, uh, that they would be killed and that their own houses and fields would be burned. I think that's very relevant to what we're, we're seeing today where we're being told to lock our door against people who are being forced to migrate um, on the border. I'm sure you're aware that people who have been putting out water and taking food are now in court proceedings right. against them and, and you know, possibly in, in, incarcerated for years. Mm -hmm. For instance, picking up somebody who has collapsed because of the, horrible journey and taking them to the hospital, that that becomes a now criminal offense. So what, what's the, what's the alternative? I mean, and the alternative is, is being acted out in many, many different places in many different ways from housewives in Canada, putting together their resources to sponsor um, immigrants and refugees who are, who, who need a sponsor in order to come to Canada, um, to congregations in the U.S. that are offering sanctuary to, to people who are be under threat of deportation. Mm. Um, but comments can happen. Um, you can create a liberatory context in the most adverse circumstances. I mean, I, I can feel sometimes like when I'm in a detention center with, with an asylum seeker and a tra often a translator that, that we are making a little world where, where we can discuss some very, very difficult experiences, um, in, in a way that, uh, insulates us at least momentarily against the, deleterious forces that, that have created this um, enforced confinement. And same thing in, in prisons, I think. So the commons, the, the commons relies on people being available for compassionate, uh, what Kelly Oliver calls responsibility, the ability to respond, responsive relationships which which may begin um, with one person accompanying another, but which very quickly becomes a kind of mutual accompaniment because there's a mutual learning and mutual enjoyment of of the relationship that's unfolding. And those those kinds of relationships form can form what Mary Belinke has called public home places mm -hmm. where where um, a small or a larger group of people who have common concerns can can find um, refreshment in relationship with each other while also pursuing in solidarity with each other the kinds of transformations that are necessary to relieve what Arthur Kleinman calls social misery, which is also psychological misery. So this is sounds like this is what's calling to you right now is this work in detention centers and at the border um 
is this kind of what's ongoing for you right now, or I guess what's on the horizon for you? Yes, this is very much, uh, you know, in my, on my horizon, in my present and on my horizon. I'm also curious about the idea of sacrifice. Mm. We don't really find sacrifice talked about too much in psychology, and yet other cultures have been completely consumed with the necessity of sacrifice. Um, I had the opportunity to visit Peru recently and really saw how, how important that was in, in earlier societies there. So I'm interested in, in how, why we, why we're not thinking about sacrifice. I'm interested in also what I would call lamentation that there, there's a lot of, um, there are a lot, there's a lot of grieving that's that's going on and that's going to be going on, given the ecological crisis that we're in. Right. Um, and and I think that there's there's a need to understand the the, the role of lamentation. Um, so those are two two areas I'm thinking about within my own city. Um, my adjoining town is called Carpinteria. That's where my school is located. Um, we we had a lynching there um, in the late 1800s. Um, as you may know, there were uh, there were about almost 500 people of Mexican and Mexican descent lynched in the Southwest from 1880 to 1920. And um, I'm working to bring some attention to to that lynching um because i think there's a, a lot of amnesia about about the history um of my town so i've done a lot of work in the historical archives um and and i think if i i i now say to you know people who are studying psychology um study history mm. try to understand and what colonialism is, um, how did it morph into neocolonialism? Why, why does it require racism and capitalism? Um, and how can we work on undermining these pillars uh, of ongoing coloniality um, so that people can and, and communities can can thrive in a better way and in order to do that we need to understand the deep history of the places that we live in in the united states um and i'm sure other places as well but in the u.s we know that we each town no matter what town you choose has got a very very complicated history my own santa barbara has a history of um mexican and spanish people displacing and virtually enslaving um, the Chumash people and then Anglos um, placing Mexicans who owned all the businesses and the, the land, you know, in, into placing them really into poverty and taking their land away and eventually um, putting them on cattle cars and deporting them to Baja in, during the Depression but also, you know, deported the Japanese in, in the Second World War, got rid of the Chinese um, downtown in, in the 1920s and uh, community of African-Americans in the 1930s. So you have each of our cities and towns has histories of exclusion mm. um, that, that need to be understood and, and really addressed because what we're experiencing at the border it, it would not be going on if we weren't already living those histories of exclusion right. in our in our towns. Um, I see them as quite interlinked. That the that you can work on things at the border, you know, border issues um, in many different border sites within any town or city. Um, so that has my interest, and uh, I, as more and more people are forced to migrate under the current and ongoing emergencies that we're facing, we need to figure out ways to open our doors and to, you know, we will, we will often be the ones 
seeking an open door. Mm-hmm. <laughs> As we find a change, you can be you can be thinking you're in a fairly safe niche and and find that you you have no house the next day. So right. um, this is a th- this is a psychological problem, a deep psychological problem um, that you know I'd like to see us attend to really closely. Thank you. So any final thoughts? Well, in terms of um, Mad in America's focus, in in my most recent book, I have a couple of chapters on um, what it means to shift from an expert model of providing clinical services, of diagnosing and intervening clinically, what it means to shift from that model to models of accompaniment, um, which include, of course, peer accompaniment. And, uh, you know, I try to, uh, outline some of the, some of the best examples of that. Um, Basaglia's work in Italy in closing down the, all the mental asylums there and in helping Trieste become a city that, uh, welcomes people with all sorts of, of, of neural differences. Mm-hmm. Um, the dialogue model in Finland, Fountain House in New York, um, the Family Care Foundation in Sweden. I've tried to give a variety of examples um, of of where accompaniment um, makes can make a huge difference, um, but it needs to be unleashed mm. from the expert model. You know, which is is quite tied, I think, to capitalism. You know, it's like you can, you can you can charge more for your services if you're an expert, but the problem is that you undermine all the knowledge that other that the, the people that you're with have about their own situation, what they need and what they desire, um, and where you where you could be of use and where they prefer you to to put your nose into your own business. Do you know what I mean? Right, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for speaking with me. Thank you, Micah. Good good to speak with you. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views, and updates.